senior stand. I'm speaking on behalf of millions of Australians who are asking the reasonable questions. How would people be voted onto The Voice? How would regional areas be represented? I am resigning from the Greens to sit on the Senate crossbench. Senator Thorpe ditching the Greens over differences about enshrining an Indigenous voice to Parliament. To get an education, to get a job, and we all want that. We, you, me, everybody's in this for the same but reasons, who? and I, I believe that that, yeah. that requires some special attention I from don't government. Understand. Anthony Albanese all fired up. This is an opportunity to unite our nation. Hello everybody and welcome to the Ospol Chats podcast after our long, long awaited return. Well, not really awaited, we know we're really awaiting the return, but our long hiatus, we are finally back and there is a lot that has happened in the sphere of Australian politics. My name is Jack. I'm Aaron. I'm Olivia. Luke. And we're here to be talking about three major topics that has been going on in the past couple of months in the Australian political sphere. We've got the voice to parliament, Alan Tudge has resigned, Lydia Thorpe has resigned from the Greens to talk about um, her um, black sovereignty movement, as well as the Australia Day debate that was in full force um, only just a few weeks ago. We might be a bit late to the topic, but it's still incredibly important to be talking about it, um, especially in relation to the voice of parliament and indigenous rights around this country. So for the first bit, we've got a new host, which is- um, <laughs> It's mine now. <laughs> who is Olivia. So Olivia, would you mind telling us what you study here at Griffith University and what is your relation to Australian politics? If you have any. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to say quickly as well, babies come out quicker than this podcast did. Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> seven months. Seven months. Babies about the, about the same. About the same. <laughs> nearly the same time. Um, I'm studying Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Government and International Relations. You have in my Russia. sympathy. Thank you. <laughs> Much needed. Um, my connection to Australian politics. Well, I grew up in Australia for most of my life. Moved here when I was about four. Two thousand and five. <laughs> <laughs> moved here in 2005, so just grew up with it all, really. Um, yeah, I have a keen interest, so that's pretty yeah. much it. So the, the first the first topic that we have for today is obviously the voice to Parliament. It is a huge debate. It's a constitutional um, it's a constitutional question that's going to be asked to all Australians mm -hmm. uh, in April at some time, um, which is what is being speculated at the moment that this reporting. Um, it's going to be speculated that it will be when in you see April. this in eight months' time. <laughs> when you see this in eight months' time, uh, we might be, you know, a bit late to it, but you know, yeah, um, probably be like, yeah, maybe five months or something. <laughs> so, in, talking about it. So in April, um, that is when they say they're going to be bringing out the question. Now, the question has been put um, or has been drafted at. Um, a few Indigenous events that were um, done by Anthony Albanese. At the time of this recording, the constitutional question will probably be asked sometime in April. So the question will be as to whether or not um, Australia wants to have an enshrined Indigenous voice to Parliament as well as um, enshrining uh, Indigenous people as the um, First Nations or the first owners of Australia. So um, there's been a lot of talk about this, a lot of debate about it. Um, to start off on a broad question, where do we all stand? on the voice to parliament. Do we think it's a good idea, a bad idea? What do we think? Who's going first? <laughs> well, you, the guest can go first. The guest, guest, sorry, the newbie can go first. <laughs> All right, um, bit iffy where I stand. Not in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you saying that because you're English? You no, hate indigenous people. Wow. No, it's because I take a bit of a radical stance in relation to like the Australian legal and political system. Um, and I can understand why people are a bit hesitant about it, like with it being a committee, um, it seems more like a band-aid than actually a resolution. But I feel like the only way to actually resolve Indigenous issues with our like, legal system and political system would actually be breaking down the legal system that we have now. Um, because it was founded on the idea of terra nullius and sovereignty. Um, and under the, under the term of sovereignty, we have this idea of like the doctrine of tenure. And that's basically like the Crown owns the land and we all kind of, I guess, own it, like rent it out from her, like the crown. Oh, well, him now. <laughs> Rest yeah, that was... yeah, that also happened in between the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Queen, Queen Elizabeth died, so. You know, I had to say for like how many years? 70? Mm. Mm. Um, 
But if you take that away, it's like the skeleton of the current legal system. And that's why I think like Marbo wasn't obviously an important case. Um, and it was, but it was more on words rather than like something that actively changed things. Mm. Cause you can claim that, you know, Australia wasn't terra nullius and you know, oh, we're reneging that whatever. Um, but the system we have now still upholds that idea if we still continue to have crown sovereignty over the land mm. with tenure. So I can understand why people are a bit hesitant. Indigenous people themselves, it's kind of like, you know, I guess, what do you think? Conceding, concession, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Because I think, Luke, did you have any thoughts on that or? No, I was, no, just, I was just actively listening. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's probably the most in-depth answer to this yeah, you, I shouldn't have made you go first, yeah, I shouldn't have made you go last. <laughs> no, but, that, but those were all good points though, and I think also too, there's a bit of a, um, not a huge divide in the Indigenous community. I mean, there's obviously um, Lydia Thorpe who has her own thoughts and opinions on the, we'll uh, on the voice, of, well, we will get to her on the Voices Parliament. Um, but I think that in terms of the, uh, how the Indigenous community feels about this, I mean, obviously um, it's going to be a tough time for them, mm. um, especially given the fact that there's been a lot of uh, well, obviously, some horrible things being said about, um, you know, Indigenous people and their land rights and whatnot um, from certain members of the public or certain sects of the public. And I think, you know, it, it, it opens the door wide, o wide open for people to criticise that. Um, kind of like in the same-sex marriage blog site, how basically um, it opened the door. Like, a lot of um, gay and lesbian, trans and whatnot, like, all people part of the LGBTQ community, um, it opened the door for people to basically, you know, try to denounce their, you know, sexuality or whatnot. It's I horrible do, stuff like that. And I hate to say this, I do agree with Peter Dutton in the way that I, I agree with what he's saying, but yeah. not why he's saying it. He's mm. saying that we need, he's campaigning against the government, he goes, we need to know more information before we go on the polls. What's this going to look like? Is it a third chamber of parliament? Is it mm. an advisory body? Mm. The Australians need to know. And I agree with that. Mm. I agree. Well, first of all, I agree with the voice to parliament. I think it's important mm. and I think it needs to be, I need, I think it needs to clarify, I agree with it too. Just to yeah. <laughs> I, I also, I also and, agree with it as well. <laughs> And I agree, I, also with, agree with it. I agree with that message Peter Dutton said, yeah, but yeah. obviously Peter Dutton's coming from the perspective of he's trying to trip up the Labor government, it's mm. a gotcha moment, so I don't agree with, with that, but I do agree that it's, the way that I understand it, it's not a third chamber of parliament, it's no. an advisory body, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's just how will these laws affect Indigenous people, so I think yeah. that's yeah. an important step, because I mean, we learned that in our policy um, subject, like our policy making subjects, that yeah. Community consultation, especially with First Nations people, is the most important step of the policy making process. Yeah. Mm. So the fact that we're only doing that now after what, 122 years after Federation, yeah. Yeah. that's and, concerning. And especially when you compare it to some other countries that have, um, well, maybe not total reconciliation, but they've at least like done more. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look across the ditch, like, New Zealand, but they even, have if, even if, yeah, if you look at New Zealand, like our closest neighbours, they've like made quite big steps in terms of reconciliation with the native Maori people. Mm -hmm. Even if you look at Canada, there's been some um, progress, and this is still like under the same commonwealth, yeah. all mm -hmm. these different countries. But it just seems like Australia seems to be so much far behind. I think that this is kind of a necessary step. I do agree with Olivia in that, you know, ultimately the entire skeletal frame is kind of oppressive to indigenous people as a whole. Mm -hmm. But I think that if we do like want to actually make some steps, I think this is a mm -hmm. good first step. But to say that this is the end, I don't think so either. I did like the point that you made that it seems to be like a band-aid. Yeah. It seems like a band-aid fix because yeah. I know that a lot of the a lot of the media is coming out that in, are in support of the voice are saying, well, look at the last referendum on indigenous rights, whatever, the 19, I can't remember the last, yeah, like the year, of what, the 63, no, whatever it was. Mm. Yeah, and you know, now we have the closing the gap report, like how do we, how do we bridge the yeah. gap between indigenous Australians and the rest of Australia? Mm. Well, the government doesn't action all those recommendations, and that this closing the gap report is seen as such a huge landmark mm. step in the advancement of of indigenous peoples. But it's as long as the voice doesn't end up that way, and that the government actually listens to what the voice is saying. Yeah, well, I think it's actually kind of interesting because we're actually filming this today on National Sorry Day. Um, yes, it's, it's we been, are. It's been it's been fifteen years since Kevin Rudd made his apology speech. Um, well, back in 2008, if you can believe it or not. Yeah. Anyway, time flies too quickly. Yeah. Um, it's, and, and how much progress has been made since then uh, is hotly debated, obviously. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of money going in to all these Indigenous programs and, and whatnot, but it doesn't seem like it, there's a lot of 
meaningful changes to those communities that are actually going to help them in the long run or help them in the future and being able to provide um, good quality services for them so that they're able to actually be able to continue to live in their community and to be able to um, continue to, um, to to function within society or well, our society anyway so I think I think that it's going to be uh, I mean there's, there's a lot of people that are going to argue well you've thrown enough money at them and whatnot, so you know why isn't anything changing? And obviously the blame's put on the indigenous people when yeah. it's obviously that that's not the case mm. most of the time. But in ninety nine percent of cases, that is not the that's not the majority of the um, where the guilt should be put upon. It's the governments that fail to implement those policies. Yeah. It's, yeah. Just because you chuck four hundred million dollars into something, it doesn't mean that that money is going to be well spent or it's going to be well thought out. Or they implement a policy that will disproportionately affect them, even though it may not do yeah. it explicitly. And some will argue, well, that doesn't mean it's racist. Well, it's like, well, you need to look at the context and what those mm. impacts will have. Mm. I think the voice of parliament will be useful in that regard. Yeah. Um, for example, there was the cashless debit card scheme that was yeah. implemented to give them... Um, <coughs> government to the support but that was found to actually have really like kind of limited the opportunity that they were available to and their spending even though it may have sounded good on paper but what ended up happening was that they found they were themselves constrained they found themselves um felt like they were being tra- treated like cattle and it was honestly kind of eerily similar to how they were treated like so long ago in mm. the sem- in the 1700s when Australia was first colonized mm. so just because a law might not be explicitly racist mm. it can have dire effects on the indigenous community so i think having a voice like that will also it may not like be completely solving everything but i think if we can at least avoid future things like future situations then i think that will be valuable mm-hmm. what i think will be the really really interesting thing is the results yeah. mm-hmm. because yes looking at it from an, ob- an objective sense direct consultation to parliament for indigenous peoples, like how the laws will affect them, fantastic. And yep. the wider being, the wider being of that is the advancement of indigenous Australians. Yep. Objectively, a good, a good cause, good reason. Yeah. Yeah. But we look at the same-sex marriage public side. Yeah. Obviously, gay people being allowed to be married and having access to the institution of marriage yep. is objectively a good thing. Yeah. It's inclusivity. It's people having rights. That's yeah. great. Mm. But you have to remember, 30% of the Australian electorate voted against it. Mm. Yeah. And that was gay marriage. Yeah. Now, you look at, you look at race issues in Australia mm. and the treatment of Indigenous Australians, how high will that 30% get? Will we see yeah. 60, 40? Will we see 55, 45? I know what the polls and data and surveys and all that says that the majority of Australians support an Indigenous voice to Parliament and will vote yes on this referendum. Mm. But polls don't mean everything. Mm. Everyone thought ScoMo was going to win the last election on the polls. Yeah. He didn't. Labor majority. So that's all just polls. That's data. Polls can be wrong. It's not raw data. It's yeah. not the actual mm. vote. So Especially if more details are released. What's that well. skew going to be? Yeah, and, and also, too, the fact that the constitutional referendum, this the threshold for people to say yes is a lot higher. Yeah. So we, we can't have that discrepancy of like 30, 30% of people saying no. So all states and territories have to be in an overwhelmingly majority yes. Um, to say this, because any constitutional change is obviously very difficult yeah, to get so, through. Well, yeah. For people that don't know at home, to change the constitution, a referendum needs to achieve what's called double majority. Mm. It needs to have a majority of the popular vote and a majority of the states and territories voting for it. So it needs over 50% of the population to vote for it, and it needs four out of the six states and territories to vote for it. Yeah. Mm. And that's how you get um constitutional re- referendum and that's how you can actually probably change it but it's a high threshold and I don't think it's actually been historically that many that have succeeded yeah well it was like everyone keeps using the um, monarchy like the the republic yeah. constitution as a as a bit of a uh, like a historical sorry eight. I, I said seven it's eight <laughs> <laughs> we'll okay, crack the record on that one Every, everyone is using the republic uh, movement as an example of what not to do when to put forward a successful constitutional change. So obviously what led the Republic movement down was the Republic movement itself, because not everyone was on the same page of what this Republic should look like. Everyone already had too many questions. Okay, what's this Republic gonna look like? Is it gonna operate similarly to how we operate our government today? Is it gonna be through direct, like are we gonna be voting directly for the leader or is it gonna be similar to our system now? And you know, there was too many questions on 
you know, on the mind for a lot of these, um, a lot of these people. And look, generally with constitutional conventions, I mean, yeah, generally with these constitutional conventions, you're only asking one or one two question. questions or yeah. one question. So you're not asking, like people aren't voting on, okay, will the Indigenous Forces Parliament, will the people be paid on, on the board or how many uh, Indigenous Voices should there be for each different community, right? If we did, if we generally had that process where everyone was voting on how this voice would work, it would never get through. Or at least it would take decades for it to yeah. even do that, right? To get popular votes on each and every aspect of how it should work. So, do we think that the questions that are being asked about the voice, are they are some of them valid or are people trying to look too, way too deeply into what it, what it actually is? What do you think? I think they're being very strategic and they have learned from the Republic movement by trying to be as clear as possible mm -hmm. and not, well not broad, but they're trying, as you said, the more stuff they ask, the more likely it is to be defeated because mm -hmm. the public gets confused as well, what does this really look like? It's do you support the voice? And is, isn't the second question, do you support the constitutional recognition of Indigenous yeah. Australians? Yeah. yeah. So I think that they're very simple questions that the public can go, I support that, I support that. Yeah. Not, I support a voice, but I don't support that they're being paid that much. I support that there will be that many people in the voice, but I don't support that Queensland's only getting six representatives, but the Northern yeah. Tories getting yeah. three. Like, it's like all the nitty gritty stuff yeah. is, is not going to be voted on, and the, it's never going to be voted on. The more yeah. wide it is, the more likely I think. The, the more narrow you go and start going, well, yeah. this, this, that. And this, I think that. that is like kind of what more conservative or like people who would vote for no are exactly using. Mm. And I think that's what Peter Dutton was going like. Like what you were saying, Luke, when Peter Dutton was saying, I want information, yeah, that might sound like good on paper, but I think we all know that the reason he's doing it isn't because he actually it's not really he's cares. Yeah. Yeah. Change. Anyway, so actually, that's a good jumping off point because Peter Dutton obviously is in a very tricky spot right now. Mm -hmm. He has to try and appease his conservative base by, you know, trying to make it so it looks like that he's like opposing the voice or that he has, just has questions for the voice and whatnot. I mean, David Littleproud from the Nationals months ago already has outlined that he's going to completely reject the voice along with the Nationals party. I think he looks weak though, because yeah. originally the Nationals were going to support it. Mm. Mm. But now they're against it. I didn't know about that. Yeah, they're originally going to support it and I can't remember his name, but there was a senator in the Nationals party that has quit the party room mm. to sit on the crossbench because he supports the voice. Yeah, I yeah I did hear about that news. Sorry, I didn't know about the Nationals already having that. They had they initially they said we're going to support it, mm -hmm. and then Little Proud came out and said because it was under it was that. under pressure from they haven't they have an Indigenous senator in the party mm -hmm. just just since there's something price I, I just since price that's Cinder 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 Cinder. Yeah. she's against it, and all of a sudden David Little Proud's come out and gone no the Nationals are against it we won't be supporting it, mm. and that's what that senator the male one he's. John the Crossbench and he's saying, well, we should be supporting. So, so Olivia, do you think that with Peter Dutton, obviously, I mean, because we already know what David Littleproud's position is on The Voice, do you think that, and I don't mean to feed you a question, but he has said your name and he's looking at me. <laughs> but I think... This is the experience of women. You, anyway. <laughs> yeah, with, with Peter Dutton not being too affirmative on The Voice, you know, he, he's not confirmed or denied that he's going to be supporting The Voice, do you think that this is kind of like a stalling tactic, tactic or do you think this is something a little bit, you know, this, he actually is asking the questions, you know, about the Shh, indigenous Peter Dutton. Yeah. This is a man who tried to take mobile phones away from people in refugee, like, detention centres. Good point. So it does not surprise me. Typical politician move, like, you know, mm. yeah. playing his cards. Um, and I think a big part about this is everyone's turning it into, like, identity politics, and mm. obviously it is to an extent. But then they're missing the part that if you want to achieve equality, you have to focus on raising up marginalised communities yeah. and you can have well, have the quality. So you need equity to achieve equality. And I think people just completely ignore that. It's like, well, why are you focusing on Indigenous voices? If you want to be equal, you shouldn't just treat everyone the same. Yeah. It's and, like ignores the nuance. And, and, it's, and that's really frustrating because I, I think you put that really well in terms of like people just removing the nuance. Because a lot of the callers on Boomer Radio that I like to call it, because I do listen to Boomer, it's a guilty pleasure of mine, I do listen to Boomer Radio. It's very fun. It is in the, very in fun. In the, the worst way possible. It's fun as a, it's fun if you like to raise your blood pressure. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot like of... Facebook. Exactly. Yeah. Facebook comment sections as well, that's a great way to get the blood pumping. Or yeah. Twitter. Or Twitter. Even better, that's a cesspit though, oh, Twitter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Just vote no, hashtag. Oh, that's been trending for ages though. I'm surprised it got trending for a couple of days in a row, the vote no. Yeah. But um, but on Boomer Radio, a lot of the talking points are kind of like what you were going into. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, if you're going to give Indigenous people a voice, then why not give you know, Asians a voice or yeah, other, like, you know, it's, exactly it's, that. or like, it, it's, they're completely missing the point in that, you know, it's, it, it, yeah, exactly. They're missing so, the point yeah. that even though legally, yeah, like, people of different races, including the Indigenous people, are legally equal. Mm. Let's not forget about the fact of what you were talking about earlier, Olivia, yeah, that sure. legally, what is this? Mm. What is this? Like, what is this system that we live in? Mm. And it's one that was, built on the back of colonialism yep. it was built on the back of violence it's literally oppressive in its structure so if you can't really i don't think it's good to say oh well if we just treat everyone the same it's like the way that we treat everyone as is mm. is already bad mm. yeah because if you and have, people don't want to acknowledge that i think yeah because if you have two people right like one person's on this kind of like level and another person's on this if you treat them the same you're never going to change things. You yeah. have to focus on raising them up to that level. Mm. Yeah, that's I think yeah, again, that's that's a good way to put it because again, it's like it's that it's that otherism, you know, why do we give them so much money? Why do we give them so much support? What what about us? What about us? What, Maybe what about our, what about the homeless people? It's like, we're not so, it, it's not like homeless people on the streets isn't an issue that we're not trying to fight or anything like that. Yeah, it's not it's like there are other issues in our communities or like in um, in more like suburban communities aren't facing, you know. We're, we're not completely ignoring that. It's just obviously indigenous communities face different issues that we mm -hmm. need to solve and that we need to try and fix. And obviously those cost money and time and resources and whatnot, just like any other issue would. Mm. So it's not it's not like treating them separately or differently. It's just different communities I deal with different issues and I don't think I don't think that's necessary. I also just find it kind of disgusting about like why people would treat this like a competition. Mm. Mm. I understand that, you know, it like that's just kind of like sometimes how it is. Like as a matter of like practicality, you can't um focus on every issue. And it's natural that some people might feel left behind. But I think it speaks to, I'm going to be honest, it speaks to a real big level of privilege when you think that Indigenous people getting rights or immigrants getting rights or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Disabled people get, like people with disabilities getting getting rights. Mm. Definitely not a personal thing for me. No, I don't, no of course not. <laughs> um, when people th treat that like um, a competition and like that mm. they're going to lose out and that they should be disqualified from getting those adventures that may help them, when they are suffering under under something that may under a system that may not properly support them, mm. it just reeks of. There's something deeply unsettling about it. I think it like is kind of like. Like on a deeper level, I feel like there's like a kind of selfishness that goes on, mm. and that's kind of what I feel whenever I listen to conservative politicians talk a lot about this stuff. Mm. And I guess also continue. Oh, that? it's just gonna be like similar yeah. like sentiment. It's the same thing, like, you don't get to have an opinion on whether someone gets rights as well. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, what's well, traditional values? Yeah. It's like, that's not how yeah, that works. I'm just like, I'm sorry, your traditional values are bad. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then everyone's like, like, oh, but it's just my opinion. I'm like, no, no you're no. not. I'm like, I'm like, no, it's not an opinion. You can have it's, an opinion on colours you like, not whether people can have rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I think that that's where we draw, like, the, 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 line, the line in the sand as well when it comes to opinions and... Because mm -hmm. I think with a lot of these debates, especially when it comes to such um, high stakes, things like people's rights and whatnot, and um, Indigenous people's rights specifically, I think that a lot of people go, well, like what Aaron was saying, well, that's just my opinion. You, yeah. you, know, you have to respect that. And, you know, in to, a, in a West, to, to an extent, you know, in a, in a in, I, think, I think this is more seen in like, you know, Western societies or like in societies where uh, free dis free discussion is encouraged and whatnot. You know, everyone has an opinion, and you have to respect it. Even if you disagree with it, you have to respect it. And I think, mm. I think it's definitely like what you guys were saying in, in the sense that you know, if you if you are literally either playing devil's advocates for people's human rights, or if you just have an opinion that's going to infringe on someone else's human rights, then you know that's really really bad. I mean, that's why I keep bringing it back to the same sex marriage plebiscite because that opened up the doors for a lot of people to just make some really outlandish claims about um, people within the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And then also to um, try to den deny their, either um, their sexuality or their existence in the case of trans people. Like I don't think that 
like I don't think that obviously they should be cancelled or whatever and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not gonna lie. It's like when they say stuff like that that's outwardly harmful, they need to expect that people are not going to like that. Mm. Okay. And they should not be surprised. And I think that people shouldn't be a shouldn't be a feel bad about expressing their outrage over that. Mm. It's like, yeah, if you're gonna play double advocates with someone's rights, then you should expect that kind of backlash and you should understand that people are rightfully going to be upset about that. Exactly. It's freedom of speech, not freedom from consequence. <laughs> exactly. That's the motto that I think I think everyone here subscribes yeah, subscribe yeah. to. Yeah, like free, freedom of speech, not <laughs> like freedom from consequence. Quiet. <laughs> I've just, I just been letting you guys go. I mean, I think at the end of the day, as Jack said, it is it is a consequence of living in a free society. Yeah. It's like I mean, if you have that opinion of I think there's a I think the line is being blurred here. I think if you have the opinion of, no, I don't believe in the voice of parliament, that's your opinion. Yeah. But if your opinion now becomes, I don't believe in a voice of parliament because I don't think you should have that ability because mm. yeah. why are you yeah. in your voice? I think there's a very yeah. different, yeah. A very different, yeah. different line between like disagreeing and advocating for, well, how did you put it? You said you don't get to have an opinion about whether yeah, someone has a right. Yeah. I think you can disagree, but you can't, Outward, you don't get control over someone's rights. So I think mm -hmm. we need to clarify that yeah. there is a line between yeah. having an yeah. opinion, which is perfectly fine, otherwise you can't. Because it's also the difference between like an informed and non uninformed, right? Yeah. Because the people who actually are asking questions and then saying no because of these structural things, but a lot of people are doing it because it's like, well, why should they get it? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. like I said, that's a good clarification. Like I, can, yeah. like I can understand people saying no because they don't feel like they have any more information. They wonder how this might actually benefit Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Like, um, for example, when you were talking about like how you're a bit on, like a bit shaky about it mm. because you're not sure how that will actually help Indigenous people. I can understand why you might be like not want to wholly support the boys that, as it currently stands because we don't really know too much. People want to know more. Indigenous people might want to know more. Like Indigenous people, like you were talking earlier, Jack, mm. don't maybe don't feel super heard with it because they want mm. might want to know more. Mm. And, like that's all valid reasons to not quite support the boys. Mm. But like you were saying, Luke, when people don't want to support the boys because of some ignorant, like when they're arguing from ignorance or privilege. And that's when I think that they should kind of be subjected to that kind of criticism. Yeah, yeah. and just as a bit of a, of a capstone to this subject, because um, because we've got just two more to talk about, um, <laughs> if we can, if we can fit two more in there, because <laughs> Australia Day is the other one, and that's probably going to take up the rest of the podcast. So, do we think that? But what are our bets that Peter Dunn is going to support the voice department? Look, do you begrudgingly think? support? Because okay. oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Off. I know in the interest of time, go on. Sorry. I'm not hopeful. Mm. I don't think he will either. I don't think he is going to, but I can see the begr begrudgingly. I, I'm just going to say it really quick. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go for it. Yeah. I think begrudgingly because even at this point in time, he's already saying that we need to make sure that the no side is equally funded to the yes side. Mm. To come out and say that we need to fund the people that are campaigning against this shows that he doesn't believe in the merit of the yes vote. Yeah, I think that what Dutton is, and what I was trying to allude to earlier, is that Dutton's in a very difficult spot. He's trying to play to the, to the conservative base of the Liberal Party, but at the same time, playing to the conservative base of the Liberal Party does not work because, as we've seen from the federal election, that just what got them completely white. I know we see Scott Morrison's leadership in one, we talked about this in the first episode of the podcast, um, but a lot of... 12 months ago. As, which was <laughs> nearly 12 months ago. I mean, I thought, seven months ago? Oh, anyway. Anyway. It, it's but, but I think it, sorry to do no well even so to mention that he walked out on this day fifteen years ago he walked out on the national apology to yeah. stolen generations mm. now I know people say even Linda Burney said it she, she said that people can change but if you're a I don't know how Peter Dutton how old Peter Dutton is but let's say that Middle let's age. say that he's in let's say that he's fifty five and he was yeah. forty of the national yeah. apology mm. you're a forty year old adult male you've mm, got yeah. almost or maybe to the half of your life mm. if you can't realize that saying sorry to the, uh, a generation that was actively tried to bred out stolen from their families if yeah. you believe that walking out on that apology is appropriate then there's something fundamentally wrong with that opinion yeah. and now that we're talking about constitutional recognition i think that it's the same. If Peter Dutton wasn't the leader and he could have stayed, I think he absolutely would. I yeah. think I think that's a really good point too to mention in history because Dutton did walk out on that 2008 apology because he was so opposed to it. Yeah. I think a few other Liberal MPs yeah, also did too. as he well. He was the only front venture. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's definitely going to be a tough road for him. 
I think that the begrudgingly accept would probably be the most probable outcome because again, if the Liberal Party fail, if, if they go out and say no and the referendum succeeded, then they would be seen as getting in the way of um, reconciliation. Yeah. And they would just, they would never be forgiven for that basically, or nearly basically never be forgiven yeah. for that. Because again, Australian politics, very short term memory. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think it's gonna, it's a, it's a tough road for him. I think it's a really tough road. And if he says um, no, and the campaign fails, then he would also be blamed yeah. for getting in the way of reconciliation as well. So it really is kind of a lose-lose, unless he goes yes and tries, and the little party tries to, to cash in on some, some political brownie points. Yeah. yeah. So that's... Okay, sorry, I'll let you go. You can so move on to the next topic. Strategic. <laughs> it's purely strategic. It's purely strategic. Very strategic. And for, which is unfortunate because it shouldn't I don't really be... Best. I don't believe in him being genuine about his support oh, for it for a second. It, it shouldn't be about strategy at the end of the day. Yeah, it should be. Shouldn't be. People's rights shouldn't be a political football. Yeah, yeah. that's which it. Which is how I feel like it's being treated. Which, which speaking of political footballs, Australia Day. I thought you were about to start talking about the Super Bowl. <laughs> the Super Bowl. <laughs> Not the Super Bowl, because this is Ozpol chats. We're truly patriots. And we're talking about football, we're talking about the NRL, okay? I like that. Exactly. So we, we don't care about America. We can talk we, about American. We can talk about American stuff on Jack and Luke's new podcast, China. <laughs> <you know, laughs> <you know, laughs> That's a good point. You know, that's a very good point. New podcast, trying to get better damn well buddy to listen. <laughs> exactly. Love that. That's right. Uh, I think so. Uh, what's being played around as political football is Australia Day. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Australia Day has been a massive debate over the years and years and years. And it just seems the debate comes earlier and earlier every single year. It's been a huge culture war talking point. You know, obviously, Australia Day, the 26th of January, celebrates uh, all the it's really going, it's it's going on for depends years. on how you view it. Obviously, it depends on what community views it. But it celebrates the found, well, not the founding, the discovery of Australia through um, the Botany Bay in Sydney Cove on January twenty sixth, when the first settlers came in. Mm -hmm. And obviously, for for white, white Australia anyway, that celebrates the beginning of this new and young country. Whereas for Indigenous Australians, it marks the beginning of an awful, awful repressive time in their history, where for hundreds and hundreds of years they've been systematically like what Luke was saying, um, bred out, massacred, and just a whole bunch of just awful, awful, awful things have happened. That's still affected communities to this day. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring out a big, big question. Australia Day, should we change the date? Yes. <laughs> Why yes. is that? As you said, <laughs> it marks the beginning of colonisation in Australia. Mm. And like, um, yeah, yeah <laughs> the beginning of like genocide. That's it. That's all that should be said. Yeah, yeah. Podcast that, <laughs> the system that continues to disadvantage indigenous people to this day. Like, mm. I know this is gonna alarm a few people, but I have some very strong opinions. Wow. Oh, oh, really? Really? Hey, now, you I, I fundamentally believe in changing the date. Yep. I think okay. that it needs to be changed because to me, I'm going to go on a side note of why I'm a good person. I was worried you were going to go the other side. <laughs> now, I think it should be changed because I, I come from the perspective of people that go, oh, it's un-Australian to change the date. It's Australia Day. It's, you know, we've done it on the 26th. This is the day that we celebrate Australia. To me, I think it's un-Australian to have a party where all Australians can't be involved. Mm. That's my yeah. take. I yeah. think move the date so everybody can be involved and everyone can celebrate being a part of Australia, living in Australia, participating in Australia. Yeah. Because not everyone wants to celebrate being Australian. Some people might want to celebrate just living here or celebrating the culture or whatever it is because yeah. I'm sure some Indigenous Australians right now don't like celebrating being Australian on the 26th. I wonder why. It's a personal <laughs> reminder. Yeah. Yeah. Day of mourning. And even what you've to talk about, them. and for the record, by the way, yes, I also support changing the date because also, guess what? The date had never been consistent in the past. They yeah. only recently instituted the whole that it should be on January 26th. And for it to actually being celebrated on January 26th is kind of... I feel like, hmm, yeah, so you choose to celebrate Australia Day on January 26th. Just like, mm. let, like, think about that for a second. And I'm like, yes. yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead with this. I'm like, mm, very sensitive of you. Um, what you've talked about in the past, Jack, yeah. is... Moving, just moving the date to January 1st, mm. which was the actual day that Australia was entered was into a federation on 19, 1901. That's it, when all the states became, you know, their own states, yeah. and that's when we became federated. And when the, common, and when the Constitution itself was um, 
like a train that actually came into existence. That's it. But I think Luke, That's you were going yeah, to you 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 compound on yeah, that. I, have some, I, I want to hear more of you. Regarding the, de- I have some. Well, not, I don't have strong opinions about Australia Day. I have strong opinions regarding the debate around Australia Day. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because to me, I view it the same way as Melbourne Cup. Because to me, the way that I see it, and this is going to, that's going to sound wildly strange, but to me, I only ever see people arguing, let's change the date around Australia Day, just like I do Melbourne Cup. There's, this is going to be a bit of a cherry picking and a bit of a tangent, but throughout the entire year, there's the Caulfield Cup, there's the Cox Plate, there's the Everest. You don't see protests on those days. You see the protests on the, the first the Tuesday of November, yeah. you see it on Melbourne Cup. And to me, it's the same for Australia Day. You know, the debates, I know you said that debates every year they're getting earlier and earlier, but to me, the debates only ever seem to start around a couple of weeks before the date, whether it be the first week of January or the second week of January. Mm. I only have ever seen the debates start in January, and yeah. by January the 28th, the debate's over. It's Everyone's forgotten about it. It's out of the national consciousness. Yeah. I think that if you believe in changing the date, well... I mean, we all believe in change the night, but I think if you believe in camp, like actively campaigning, if you're one of the people that march on on um, Australia Day, if you're the Aboriginal War Resistance, or if you're in Brisbane, or Mangin, if you prefer to call it that, mm-hmm. if you're on the streets actively rallying and campaigning and holding flags, always, always, always will be, then it should be campaigned more. It's, I mean, and I know I'm going to cop some flack for this of, you know, it's, 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 its own thing, but I think that if you want change, you have to actively campaign for it because, like yeah. I say, by January 28th, I've forgotten the debate's over. Mm. And I'm someone who, I mean, I don't personally celebrate on Australia Day, mm. but I'm someone who supports changing the vote. And if I'm someone who's agreeing with what you're saying and I've forgotten it two days after the thing you're trying to change, mm. then there's something fundamentally wrong with their campaign. Mm. And then my second, and I know you've got something <laughs> to talk about, and my second point is a lot of people. A lot of people at like are okay with changing the date. You know, there's research and stuff that say that the majority of Australians would support changing the date. But the people that don't, say it's a good what, 40, 50, 40, 45% of the country that don't want the date to change. They're the people that are celebrating, like actually probably celebrating it, like having barbecues and, and having these big functions and whatnot. They're the ones that are gonna have the loudest pushback to changing it. So when you're out there out there campaigning and then the campaign's over and all the rallies and within the big streets of Sydney and Melbourne and um, Brisbane are over and just you see all the rubbish and whatnot that are left over from these protests, that's going to piss the people off that you could flip over to your side, but you aren't because of the way the protests happen. And I know it's all the only way to wake up. It's the same logic as the climate rebellions of we need to stop the roads and we need to take to the streets and we need to destroy some shit for people to wake up. But I just don't know if that's the right way to go about it because... I mean, there's people like us that would support change the day, but there are people in this country who are very fervently against change the day for whatever yeah, reason. I know, that is. I know people personally like that. I don't know why people are so adamant that it has to be the 26th. I don't see the logic in it because, like Aaron said, it's only been around like this for 30 years, and it's even changed a couple of times in that 30 Four years. times in total. Four times. So yeah. it doesn't have to be the 26th. But there's people who don't support changing it, who are on the fence and could be flipped to changing it but won't support it because of how it's being campaigned. And I mean, like me, like my Melbourne Cup argument, it's over by the 28th. Like, mm. I, I don't know. You can go now. Oh, sorry. I, just, I mean, I'm still white as well, right? But, <laughs> but the only thing that comes with it then from like a position of privilege, like it's over for you. Oh, it you absolutely comes from a position of privilege. But that's just <laughs> yeah. the way that I see it as, I don't want to say the average Australian, but... Non-Indigenous Australians, the, say, like... Well, the average non-Indigenous Australian, I suppose, that's the perspective that I'm coming from. And yeah, it does sound entitled, and yeah, it does sound privileged, but there isn't a discussion, like, there's only a discussion of Indigenous Australians and the rest of Australia when we're talking about Indigenous issues. It's... Like, I had a point in my head, but I've completely lost it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that then speaks to, like, recognition for Indigenous Australians, because throughout the year, right, like, there's people who are constantly going talking about the decolonization of Australia. Like, I know many people are very politically active and mm. trying to, you know, break down these institutions that, you know, put young people in prison, like, it's like five times more mm, yeah. than the average like, non-Indigenous person. And like say, we, I think we just then ignore it now. That's it. It doesn't affect us anymore, so we can just push it under the rug. So, like, I can see what you're talking you just about. You the logic, though, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, it's I, definitely a privilege thing. Yeah, I think that whatever happens, either be January 1st, May 8th, I know that's been mean. Yeah, I hate day. that. I'm absolutely against changing the date if it's to May 8th. I, I think... Oh, you, old, I old, think Don, old Don bloody British red coat. If that <laughs> date gets changed to May 8th, I'll be walking around on January 26th. If the, <laughs> the opinion of changing it to May 8th, because it sounds like May, is the stupidest bloody thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I, think, I think it is genius. This actually might I, be the first crossroad I in the entire podcast. That. It is it's genius. So I it's, yeah. It speaks to Australian uh, values. If I don't know. To Australian it's... values, then why isn't the date changed to May already? Uh, because <laughs> racism. <laughs> would the old white blokes at the RSL celebrating Australia Day? Would they not rather celebrating it on the day that sounds like May? They kind of would. would. I'm not gonna lie. I reckon they would kind of love it because they'd probably just be like, "Oh yeah, that's kind of funny, eh?" Mm. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to once again restate that I do support changing the day. I just I had also a few around the conversation. Yes. Also because I, I, also because, because we, now Luke made me also like because we need <laughs> <laughs> also because we need a little bit of comedy. No, but mm. that's good to have like the conflicting ideas because then you can really talk about it. Because like when no, you, you call me racist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but no. <laughs> it's the same thing where we were talking before about um, voice to parliament, where you brought in that clarification that really gives a bit more nuance to the conversation. Mm. And so it's the same. Not it's not, <laughs> no, but you're right. pointing. No, that was yet. No, but pointing that out does show the lack of recognition for Indigenous people in Australia because yeah. people only care about it when it affects them being mm. able to party, right? Mm. Yeah. Like when it, the other, only other times, like I don't even think, like we talked in class one time about how if you need change, you need to acknowledge that Indigenous people were here before you know the um, British in the Constitution, and people couldn't even do that. Same with the flag mm. in Parliament. So you can't even do these little things, yeah. right? Well, even even the smallest thing, even the little things, which is interesting because a lot of people got really mad at Anthony Albanese in one of his first press conferences where he put the Indigenous flag... I don't understand and, you get annoyed by that. And I don't understand it either, but people got really precious when Anthony Albanese, for those who don't know, on his first press conference, he had the Indigenous flag and the Australian flag both together at the same podium. You want to know why people had an issue with that? Why is because that? Because racism. Because yeah. racism, exactly. But, but uh, to me, it's... it's those the uh, the sorry the national flag the state flag the indigenous flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag are flown together all around the country even at Griffith right on the front of the student okay, service well maybe that's not the best point <laughs> no, no, but even even yeah. well even Griffith on the student services yeah. centre like right outside and right outside of the library you, the indigenous flag and the Australian flag are always flown together including the Torres Strait Islander flag as well so those are always flown together as well the so. logic to me is if I go to Maccas and I see the indigenous flag flying alongside yeah. the national and the Maccas flag why can't we change this bloody day mm. yeah and also uh, Leah I just have two points um, one thing, like, this doesn't just go for this Australia Day debate, it goes for also the voice for Parliament, it goes for a lot of, like, these, like, progressive ideals. I'm just happy, like, like, this is incredibly low, but can I, like, not even can I, like, can everyone who, especially the people who, like, are directly, like, concerned with this stuff, like, will have it impact them, I think they deserve something, even the tiniest bit. After oh, 10 years of the LMP, I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. The second part is people want to get like up in arms about Australia Day and about like, oh, the importance of it. And they like people who don't want to change the date from January 26th are like, oh, well, because it's important about when Australia was discovered. And then they want to ignore the problem that comes with. Mm -hmm. And they say, and then they might say, like, well, in America they have uh, J July 4th. And, like, July 4th is when the American revolutionaries defeated the British. And that's when they actually, like, formally became mm. yeah. the United States of America. Mm. There is nothing too problematic in there. Now, if you want to talk about... Now, let's say that the day that, they, that the Americans celebrated was when the British colonised the Americas. That would be a different argument, I'm pretty sure. And there mm. is still a lot of argument about how colonialism worked in the Americas as well. Mm. But July 4th is not really What's a unifying debated because day. It yeah. was a unifying date about when the when the American Revolutionaries defeated the British Empire. But I think not where us where we're celebrating the date where like the British like colonizers landed on Australia and that was the beginning of a long chat. Let's just call it what it is. It's a genocide. Yeah. Well, e even the because I think this goes back to a very fundamental point is education mm -hmm. because a lot of us 
in either high school or primary school would have learnt at least a little bit of uh, Australian history. A little bit. And I think a lot of the ways that we see history, I mean, this is a very important point because history is an analysis of the past. Mm. The past is uh, everything and everything that has ever happened up until this point. Yep. History is an analysis of the past. History, and this is what a lot of people don't understand when they say, oh, they're changing history, they're changing history. Yeah, no, we're, it's, we're, not that, it's, not that, it's not that we're changing the past. The past is the past, that can't change. Yeah. It's our understanding of what happened in the past that changed. And obviously, the reason why a lot more people have become, especially the younger generation, have become a lot more, dare I say, woke, on this issue, oh, of, God, I don't know that God, that woke mob. That, no, that, that I might have compared that to me. Melbourne Cup, but he said woke. That, yeah, <laughs> that hurt for me to say that, but I, I mean it ironically. God, I hate woke mob. But stuff. before you said woke, I thought that the point of education yeah, is very important. Yeah. It, it has changed because we have. In the Australian curriculum, even which, by the way, the federal government under Stuart Robert did approve that curriculum. So, if anyone in the federal Liberal Party has ever said, "Oh, we disapprove of the curriculum. We think it's full of radical things in there," they approved it, so they can't say anything about it. So, essentially, the content around uh, colonisation and the, especially in the senior year, senior years of Australian history, when they learn about when Year Eleven and Twelve students learn about the Frontier Wars. Yeah. And all well, the horrible like, things it's, like it's framed. Blue. It's framed as the frontier wars. It's mm. framed as yeah, one conflict. country against conflict. another. It's yeah. framed as a conflict. Yeah, it's not that. It's a bunch of guys with guns yeah. going to shoot blokes with sticks. Mm. And and that is right. simplifying it. Okay, but I mean, you can't call it's, it a war. Yeah, it's, a it's, it's a genocide. Well, and that's the thing. There's there's more in, there's more emphasis on the massacres that happened, over 700 of them that have happened between yeah. the, over the 400 they years. They marched and, women, men and children off of the cliffs. Yeah. That's so, not a war. No, no, it's not. And, and that's the thing, that there's been a lot more emphasis placed on the horrible, horrible things that definitely did happen mm. on the on, through, through the colonialisation of Australia. And I think that, obviously, a lot of younger people having this fresh knowledge in their minds are going to have a very different view on... Uh, how we view Australia as like uh, the founding of Australia as opposed to an older generation mm. who might have had that history kind of glossed over or you know oh, or even romanticized or even romanticized yeah. in a way you know I mean obviously Captain James Cook has been romanticized to a certain degree oh, Captain yeah. Captain Arthur Philip has also been yeah. romanticized in a way but Valentine's Day is coming up so we can celebrate the death of is it James Cook or um, it was James Cook, Cook yeah. he was in Hawaii he got bashed, bashed in by, by, the by the natives on Valentine's yeah. Day so, so say we go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can always count the Hawaii. Change the date. <laughs> change the date. That's the main takeaway from that. But I, I think, yeah, that, that I think the education has changed, and that's why I think a lot of, especially older people in the older generation, are seeing, you know, this is a change of history. Why are they teaching kids about all the horrible stuff that colonizers did uh, to? But, but it yes. goes to show, though, us four, we've recently, well, not recently, but five, six years ago, we yeah. graduated high school. Mm. We support change in the day. If you look at the class of 2013, 10 years ago, mm. would four people all say yes? Would yeah. it be three mm. that say yes? Would it be two that says yes? Or would it be one that says yes? Yeah. Would it be all four? Probably not. Mm. And then you go back to the class of 2003. Yeah. They, I can probably say hand on heart that all four of them would not have said yes. Yeah, so it, it's definitely... There would have been at least some debate. Well, yeah. even in our own classes, um, one of our law classes we focus on how um, like justifications for property mixed with like race, class and gender. And mm. even in previous, like you were saying, previous classes, we had to do an essay on like, you know, colonization and, um, yeah, and property. That. And people were still trying to argue that colonization helped First Nations people yeah. improve mm. them. And that's the same thing because it's, they're still using those theories that were applied when the British first came to Australia, where it was like, only men could be able to, a white man could be able to govern himself, and indigenous people obviously then weren't seen as people, mm. even that, or mm. like less than the child, so the children weren't able to govern themselves, so how could they, you know? Yeah. Well, it was like that one person that I had a discussion with on this issue, and they said that, oh, well, the colonists actually helped the indigenous Australians because they stopped them from infighting, they actually, they actually made them more civilised, and they stopped them from killing each other. And that was the way that it was framed and whatnot. So it, it's even in the most heinous of circumstances, you know, even amongst all of the evidence to suggest that colonisers 
um, categorically treated Indigenous people like they weren't even people, mm -hmm. especially even the white Australia policy. And even after the, even because that policy wasn't like many things in Australian history, that wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago, and it's that's one of the thing that always to remember with the Australian mm. history is like it's only like, like historically, it is not old. Mm. It is quite young. But it was only like, like in terms of federation, hundred years. Yeah. In terms of actual colonization, about about as old as America. Like maybe like it's a bit younger than America. It, it's still like nearing about like two hundred to three hundred years. I do love that point though of stopping them in from infighting because that's that is is such a stupid point like if, if you go back to Europe, Europe you go back to Europe two three hundred years before yeah. Australia before 1788 mm. they were fighting over Catholicism and Protestantism I can't see God in front of me but I can see an indigenous and Australian in front of me it's like the same-sex marriage debate people say no because you know God said marriage is between a man and a woman I can see a gay couple in love in front of me mm. but I can't see God in front of me mm. So that sounds like a wild point, mm. but it's just such a stupid point to say we stop them from infighting when 300 years before we were going on about, well, not we, but people in Europe were fighting about the belief of God. Mm. That, well, if that isn't infighting, I don't know what is. Well, under that logic, technically, if, if we were in an alternate history, technically, um, if Indigenous Australians wanted to go into Europe and go, okay, we're going to colonise this because you guys are infighting, and we, we're going to try and take over, you know, because we could, we're just going to stop you infighting, you know, we're going to make this place even better. We're going to improve you even, you know. It's almost like principally identical to the principles that obviously the first, uh, the first fleet came into. So I think it's the whole infighting point is just completely redundant and nonsense. Mm -hmm. So what's well, the same? Like, I know everyone brings up World War II in history, but the average person who's not like, you know, these like extreme racist people, if you ask the average person about like the invasion of Poland and like the Nazis and everything, everyone will say that's inherently wrong. There's no person that's better than another person. Clearly, it was pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to Australia and you talk about indigenous genocide and everything, people sweep it under the rug. People get so uncomfortable as well. And that's where it comes back to your whole thing as well. Like you can see this person in front of you, but you still choose to ignore their rights because mm -hmm. of like this belief in God. It's this indoctrination mm -hmm. and this Eurocentric like paternalism that we have. It's like, I don't know whether. That was a solid point. I have yes. no yeah. response to that. Uh, you know what? If this was a debate, the uh, person arguing against probably wouldn't have anything else to say. It's because well, I'm getting into. If we still have an Australia Day debate, so I think there would be something yeah. to say. They would have something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think a lot of the obviously. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, Sky News After Dark, especially the free thinkers. The free thinkers out there, is, especially your favourite Paul is, Murray. Well, Paul Murray, but no. To be fair, he's not as bad as say Andrew Bolt. Now, I think Andrew Bolt probably has a vendetta against Indigenous Australians. I don't know. He he goes really, really, well, really it, like hard it on them. Is, like, it is the guy that wrote the headline. Why are old men getting jailed for raping young boys? Yeah, he did. He did. And he also wrote the article back in. Uh, I think he, he was the first. He was the first journalist I think who got sued successfully for defamation by a community organisation. Because I think he said something. Re I probably looked this up because this could be getting into defamation territory. So probably looked this up. It's Entitled "It's So Hip to Be Black." That's it. And republished the article on its website with the title "White Is the New Black." Mm. Jesus Christ. Yeah. A second article in 2009, authored by Bolt, was published in print online entitled White Fellas in the Black. Yeah. So he's, I mean, and it's, it's the same, he's read his ugly head once again in the Indigenous Voice debate. He still refers to Aboriginals as Aborigines. Oh, the yeah, background to that, what he basically said was uh, fair skinned people in Australia with essentially European ancestry, but with some Aboriginal descent, of which the identified individuals are examples who are not sufficiently Aboriginal to be genuinely identifying as Aboriginal persons, but who, motivated by career opportunities available to Aboriginal people or by political activism, have chosen to identify as Aboriginal. Now, you look very fired up. Blood what quantum is, is a coloniser thing. Yes. <laughs> okay. What is that? So blood quantum is when you're like, I'm one eighth this, oh, yeah. I'm this. That's not how it happens. Like, yeah. um, And that's a big thing, actually. There was recently the case in 2020, Love and Tom's, and that was talking mm -hmm. about whether someone who was considered indigenous could also be considered like, well, it was like about, you know, if you're not from Australia, you're considered an alien, but there was a new um, category for people who are of indigenous descent and it was non-citizen, non-alien. Um, so it was very interesting in that as well. 
But it was the same thing where the dissenting um, judges, including uh, Chief Justice Kiefel, which I was very disappointed in, um, they kind of did this, and it goes back to everything we've been talking about, where it's like strategy and it was very like mental gymnastics and legal gymnastics, where they were talking yeah. about, um, it was like indigenous connection to country and stuff. And they were mm. saying, oh, if we do that, everyone will claim and um, we'll have a bunch of people coming in saying, well, I'm indigenous, I need to be let in. And mm. that, well, this kind of um, thing happened also back in Marble as well, when um, Marble was first passed and there was a lot of like fear mongering like mm. latent fear mongering about people saying like oh well now all of the indigenous people are going to come and claim land rights over over my land and my property and my home and stuff like that and there's always like this kind of thing that happens especially in the legal sphere so some of the um decisions that i find justices make it requires an insane amount of mental gymnastics in order to try and uphold a legal system that is fundamentally quite oppressive well, it was really interesting to note in that Love and Tom's case that the position taken by the judges, uh, the dissenting judges, um, was taken by the affirmative in what's called the Marshall Trilogy of Cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that was to do with uh, Native Americans. There was probably three of them. Yeah. Um, and it was talking about land rights, and they were doing the same thing where it's like, well, if we acknowledge this, then Indigenous Americans are going to come and try and you know take advantage of the system. It was yeah. really interesting to see how like nothing's changed in that sense. Yeah, yeah. and it goes through like there's like a common train of thought that exists even across like multiple different countries and jurisdictions in the law. Mm. Mm. Well, even the whole, uh, the whole, the whole thing about like that. So you said quantum, quantum blood, blood quantum, blood, blood quantum. Like even the whole thing. I mean, this was kind of what I was alluding to earlier about the white Australia policy and all the like the um, stolen generation. And especially what Australia, like the Australian government at the time had planned for basically a genocide of indigenous people. So there's this image on the internet, which is generally one of the most disgusting things and probably nearly all of us, like the most disgusting image in probably all of Australian history, I would dare say. Um, It shows an image of a black indigenous woman just going down the um, hereditary line. I'll probably put a photo of it on the screen. And it is going from black to white and that's the ideal like to get the indigenous out of them and like both culturally and looks wise as well also the reason why why people might claim to be indigenous is usually because of that very reason because they've been literally like yeah. mm. bred out to that yeah and that's when they literally like have to look back at their own ancestry and and back at their own indigenous roots and that's one thing that i, I don't understand and then people and sorry but then the, sorry to interrupt but then yeah. that like gets into the whole thing about like when people say like well how can you say you're indigenous if you're white i think it comes to the thing where people will write this off as woke but i think people fail to recognize where you have like even gender as well like it's socially constructed and i think our concept of like black you know bl ak like in australia um, is a really good example of that. Like someone who could be as fair as me is still considered black because of the social, like you know, the historical mm. structures. Mm. Even though genetically they might not look what we consider black, right? Mm. And it's the same with like Afro Latinas. They don't just mm-hmm. call themselves Afro Black because there is back in the day of like this system where it was the closer to white you were, the better. Yeah. And that's like it's socially constructed, but people obviously. It's also don't in, see it's that also in India as well. Yeah, um, like the caste system. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, so it's, and again, this is one point that I don't understand why some people get really, like, emotional and angry about it. It's, like, the whole thing about, well, you look white, but you're claiming to be Indigenous and whatnot, because apparently the the main thing is, like, oh, you, you're just trying to get benefits, or you're just trying to get extra help from the government, or you're yeah. just trying to, it's, 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 again, another way to try and attack Indigenous people and whatnot. And look, it's not to say that there aren't people that have falsely claimed that and whatnot and tried to gain additional benefits which haven't otherwise, right? But the percentage of that is so extraordinarily low. Astronomically low. Well, it's uh, because the the thing is, and this goes to another thing, I mean, this could be a whole other episode about welfare and whatnot in this country and how we talk about and how we talk about the most vulnerable people in society. But out of, well, for instance, in 2020, it was either 2020 or 2019, that Centrelink did a study about how many people were falsely claiming to take from the system, basically trying to get more money out of it. There were 160,000 complaints made 
and there were only 100 of them that actually got like a like they, they had actually found only a hundred of those people mm. were actually rorting the system. <laughs> so if that was just general Centrelink, yeah, mm. we're talking about an indigenous population that's quite small in this country, and an even smaller percentage of people that might use like you know try to claim Aboriginal heritage and whatnot to rort the system. That's such an that's a smaller percentage than that. Yeah. So, sorry, like, sorry, not no, 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 so that was basically it. Yeah. But how much if people did play the system, mm. how much are they actually getting from the system? Because yeah. people get mad at people on welfare and say, you're rigging the system, you're getting things for free, but in the same breath, for lack of a better word, lick the boot of like these millionaires and mm. they're like, oh, you really worked for it. What? You know, Jane Reiner. Yeah. yeah. Literally. Well, she I've... was a big one, sorry, she was a big one during Marbo, mm. she fear mm. because like, okay. um, she was saying, oh, you know, indigenous people come to your house and be like, this is our land now, because yeah. she wanted people to support against it. So then they couldn't try and protect places where she wanted to mine. Mm. Well, it's well, like when Rio Tinto blew up Duke and Gorge. Yeah. I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation of that. Yeah. But there was, like, I mean, they got fined a whole bunch of money, but they're one of the biggest mining companies. They're the biggest mining company in Australia. A little That's flames, a I don't know. drop yeah. in the ocean of their coffers. It, there was basically no repercussions. But the worst part was, was in that specific instance, there were actually some... Uh, drawings there that were actually like the oldest, mm. probably one of the oldest in the world yeah. of 50,000 years old of, of a human face. Mm. So that possibly one of the first mm. drawn appearances of a human face in there and it was low. Yeah. But, but yeah. because as we know, Australian indigenous well, well, indigenous um, culture in Australia it's, it's one of the one of the oldest in the world. If not the oldest. If not the oldest. And there was also it was a very interesting because I, I did a class um and this isn't trying to be promoting for Griffith's master teaching course, <laughs> but it's it's a class called First Australians, and uh, and I think that that was a really really good class. Because not only did it teach us about the the different needs and the different learning outcomes, and also the ways in which that you're able to engage with Indigenous communities about education, but also it taught us a lot about Indigenous people as well, and a lot about Indigenous culture. And I think in the Northern Territory, there was this guy who wrote a really, really um, big book about uh, Indigenous uh, artefacts in the Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. And they actually found that it was, um, if it was in the Northern Territory or Northern Queensland that he found that with his Indigenous community, they were able to find one of the, like, the oldest um, examples of Indigenous people understanding spirituality and religion and whatnot. Well, not, not religion, but you know, so some form of spirituality. So again, one of the oldest examples mm. in the world of having a deep understanding of what spirituality is. So again, it's just another one of those things that like, it's, it's might be lost to time. Thankfully it hasn't been. That, what you were saying in the gorge, mm. that's just tragic. And again, yeah. Yeah. they took the fine, but again, the fine is not big enough but because that's just the representative of, like you say, potentially yeah. the first depiction of a human face, depiction, yeah. 50,000 years, possibly more, mm. history right there. Yeah. Just those and protecting well, racism, what, never. Well, that's what they say, right? If your punishment for a crime is a fine, it's legal for the rich. Yeah, Yeah. well, it's a it's a cost of doing business at the end of the yeah. day. Yeah. So yeah. at the end of the day, it's yeah. operational yeah. costs. So it's, yeah, it, it's just it's just crazy. It's just utterly, utterly crazy. You know, there's a lot of different, I mean, I was listening to a podcast about this on ABC Business, great podcast. Um, but I, I, they were talking about like that. Putting it all out all the yeah. plugs. Oh, exactly. I mean, <laughs> they were talking about this in terms of the data breach that happened with Medibank and whatnot. And apparently, like the fines weren't big enough, and mm -hmm. you know there needs to be bigger penalties. People were even saying about jail time for people who um, were being negligent about people, other people's data. So I don't know. Would jail time be appropriate for those people who like blew up those like ancient artifacts and whatnot? But then again. Yeah people have also argued that well if you just impose jail time then it will be more reason for them to cover it up as opposed to trying to actually take responsibility for any of like the negative actions that they took on those just did a quick like, Google Google on yeah. um, what Rio Tinto they obviously have their generic corporate response and we're sorry and we're gonna make sure it's gonna happen again hmm. well I just I just laugh at this it goes in October 2022 and I'm sure it was a few years before that in October 2022, we released our second Communities and Social Performance Commitments Disclosure Report. Now, that's a lot of corporate jargon, but first of all, why didn't the first report work? Mm. The first yeah. 
communities and social performance commitments disclosure report. What happened to that? Why wasn't yeah. that committed to? Mm. Yeah, I think again, Rio Tinto, as you said, like one of the one of the biggest mining magnates in the world and billions and billions and billions of dollars they have, right? So any fine that they were going to get was going to be a drop in the ocean. They weren't going to actually suffer any consequences for that. No. Uh, so I think it's it's a really sad... You know who is suffering the consequences of their actions? Indigenous people. Mm-hmm. No, you're and, just indigenous people. Like, well, everyone yeah. is. Because yeah. you yeah. lost that part of, like, anthropology, right? Mm. Archaeologists, historians, anyone that yeah. you can think of. Because that is, oh, this is this is another laughable thing. Yeah. In May 2020, we destroyed rock shelters of exceptional significance at Dukan Gorge near Brockman, near our Brockman I Iron Ore Mine in the Pilbara. Mm. This was a breach of trust placed in us by the Putu. Oh, I'm going to butcher this. <laughs> the Putu Kunti Kuramara and Pinakura people and other traditional owners of the land on which our business operates. At our AGM, we presented a video of some of our employees' react reflections on Dukan Gorge. Then why Gosh. did you do it? So a, a video was it like that was just after the fact. Oh, they have an they have a sustainability committee now. Ooh, well, that's well, and, okay. Look, and a, another fancy word: integrated heritage management process. Well, that Ooh. is look progress. Where could them go? Multi-billion dollar corporations are making progress. Also, that was the other thing I was going to say about like. No such thing. So, <laughs> that's also the other thing I was going to say about selling. With it's funny that we're talking about like magic corporation they also don't pay any tax in australia right rio tinto and all that like there, there's been a I like how they started out as australia yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, but just, it's such a big issue right yeah. like, but like when we're talking about welfare because again welfare, yeah. so we're, we're very emotional about welfare recipients um like trying to rot the system or trying to cheat the system the amount of money that they're going to be stealing is nowhere near the amount of money that could be uh, that, that could be taken from mega corporations who are tax bludgers they don't pay a single cent of tax in Australia. Why don't people get mad about that as opposed to the most vulnerable? And it has to do with a lot of... are the real thing. Jack, we can get into class consciousness, but that's going to be a whole other video. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and unfortunately, the camera is starting to run out of battery. So, um, I mean, I guess, I, I, guess, I guess it started off with an Australia Day thing, but I mean... I'm just looking at a closing statement. Yeah, close the statement. Seize all of Gina Reinhardt's assets and give them to the Indigenous. Base. Final thoughts, Olivia. What? What? Did you think I'm an indigenous flora? Flora and fauna. Um, I'd say the final takeaway is like obviously we were going to talk about like two what we thought would be more, well, more simple like singular subjects, mm. but it, obviously it's a very complex and nuanced issue. Mm. Um, yeah. And I do think we need big change. Um, mm. It's colonization is a continuous process it's not something that just happened hundreds of years ago it's still going on now as we continue to live under this legal system this political system people are still being imprisoned at a higher rate you know health issues dying earlier we're acknowledging it but that we're not doing anything to actually address the issues mm-hmm. i think it's also sorry i'm just hanging around one more time. Uh, 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 i think it's i think it's i'm gonna think back on you i think it's also about like staring ourselves in the faces White Australians, I mean, I'm not talking about the concept of white guilt, but even the argument that I made before I acknowledged that it came from 100% yeah. a position of privilege. Mm. And even, it's the not... rec- even the recognition <laughs> can be enough. So, I mean, it's not to say that, I mean, it, like, it's the whole decolonisation. And would I make that argument again, recognising the position of privilege? No, I would mm. Yeah, so I, it's, 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 again, it's decolonisation, right? It's not saying that, like, you have to be personally guilty about, like, you personally feel guilty about every other thing that has happened that you were not personally a part of. It's, it's it's the fact that it, you at least have to have the knowledge and at least understand and have that perspective of yeah. why all these effects of colonisation are affecting Indigenous Australians today. Yeah. I think that's what and they mean by like decolonisation. And ideally work towards yeah. rectifying that. Yeah. So like that's what they mean when we talk about decolonisation and like being allies to um, Indigenous people and stuff like that. Yeah. So not, not about embracing every like bad thing that our ancestors did, but not understanding that what our ancestors did was wrong mm. and that we should be looking to make amends and re- reconcile would you say those are your final thoughts i mean there's a lot there's a lot of it's, thoughts on this topic jack so yeah. there's hard to like say final thoughts but overall i mean i think that would probably be like the main thing to like take away is like this is a massive issue like 
universities are like university degrees sometimes are like at least like little diplomas can be centered around this. Yeah. Their entire coursework, their entire there are millions of books written on this across the world mm. in many different contexts, not just Australia, in the American context, in the New Zealand context, across multiple different in, among the African context. Mm. So many. Mm. So this is not like an easy thing. And it's okay to be unsure about like some of this stuff. Mm. But just as long as you're willing to keep an open mind, listen to indigenous to the indigenous populations, mm. learn from them, and hopefully work towards reconciliation, then I think that's like the main takeaway that we all need when it comes to this kind of debate that's even happening in Australia as we speak. And I think and I think that will be my final point too. Never stop learning. Mm -hmm. Because the minute that you stop learning, you stop thinking, you stop growing, you stop you know, you, you, yeah, you stop thinking you stop growing as a person, you know. You've always got to be in the learning mindset. You've got to be lifelong learners. That's yeah. definitely not what I learned from my master's degree in secretary teaching, so... Um, uh, but you know what that all makes us? Well, that just makes us a bunch of leftist, leftist snowflakes, sweet boys. Cucks. Oh, that's, now we need a closing statement from that little joke, and yeah. let's just close with always <laughs> was, always will be. Yes, always, always, always will be. Exactly. Wholeheartedly agree. Education breeds empathy. Oh, oh like that's... That. That's a very, that's a very that's nice one. So, again, thank you all so much for watching the return of the Ozpol Chats podcast. We'll see you in another nine months. <laughs> and with a new members. With a new member, thank you so much for um, being on the show. Thank you for having me. And, <laughs> and we'll all see you again next fortnight for another episode of the Ozpol Chats podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and we'll have to catch you guys next time. See you guys later. Goodbye.